Welcome to my lecture and today I'm going to deliver a lecture on an introduction to Indian income tax. Uh, this is uh, here, I just want to give a focus on the basic uh, concepts under Income Tax Act and if time permits, I will also focus on that how actually total income is calculated under the income tax. Now, uh, this is a paper, part of the direct tax paper, which will be, which is there under our university for the honor students in the semester three. And there is another paper for the general students in the semester four that is direct and indirect taxation. So through this lecture, I hope that you will uh, get to know something, some overall idea about the basics or introduction to Indian income tax. Okay. Now let me start with first, uh, what is tax? Now, tax, as we know that tax is a major source of revenue for any government uh, of any country. And this is generally collected by the government to meet their expenditure on account of various social welfare purposes like, you know, to provide uh, medical and health facilities, uh, to provide education, uh, for defense, for the infrastructure development, for making roads, bridges, etc. So tax is a very important thing in, uh, in uh, our everybody's life and this tax can be of two types. One we call as direct tax and another we call as indirect tax. Now what is direct and what is indirect tax? Sometimes questions comes that write a note on direct tax with uh, examples, write note on indirect tax with examples or distinguish between direct and indirect tax, uh, tax, taxes with proper examples. Now direct tax, by definition, it is very simple. In, informally that we can say, when a tax is paid directly by someone to the government, it is direct tax. When tax is paid indirectly by someone to the government, it is indirect tax. But more formally that we can say that when two things happens at the same time, that is liability to pay tax and you know burden of tax falls upon the same person, it is called direct tax. And when it falls on two different set of persons, it is called indirect tax. Okay, so simply saying that in case of direct tax, burden of tax cannot be shifted. If it is your liability, you have to pay to the government. Just one example of that is income tax. So income tax has to be paid on your income. So it is your income, you are liable to pay to the government. Okay, and ultimately you are paying this from your own pocket. So burden of tax falling upon you and liability to pay tax is also borne by you. So both the things happen on the same person that is it's called direct tax. In case of indirect tax what is happening, it's a liability to pay tax falls upon a some other person, but ultimately cost of this tax or burden of this tax is borne by some other person. Simply take an example of you went to the restaurant and you have enjoyed your food. So you know, the restaurant owner is a supplier of food. And as per the present GST law, whenever a restaurant owner supplying goods or here the food or services to uh, their customers. So this restaurant owner has to, you know, pay tax to the government. So who is liable to pay tax? The restaurant owner? Okay, but this restaurant owner is not paying the tax from his own pocket. He is adding this GST or goods and services tax uh, in the bill of the customers. So ultimately, restaurant owner is doing what? Collecting the tax from the customer, paying to the government. Isn't it? So who is liable to pay tax? The restaurant owner, there is a supply. But actually who is bearing the burden of this tax? Who is, you know, who, to whom uh, this uh, cost finally um, uh, is uh, borne by? It is the customers, okay? So there are two set of persons. One is who is liable to pay tax, restaurant owner, there is a supplier. And another one is who, on whom this burden is falling, that is the customers. Okay, so that's why, you know, ultimately government is collecting tax from the individual or final consumers, but through some intermediaries that can be a dealer, that can be a supplier, that can be a manufacturer. Okay, so this is what is called indirect tax. So some examples, so in case of indirect tax, easily you can shift the burden of tax to the other person. The cost of the tax is shifted to the final consumer. Okay, but government is, you know, knows only the restraint owner, that is the supplier. Okay, so supplier is liable to pay tax to the government, but finally, ultimately, it is uh, the cost of this particular tax is borne by the final consumer. And that's why indirectly government is collecting tax from the final consumer. That's why it is indirect tax. Now, some example of the direct tax is income tax, as I told you, property tax, municipal tax, etc. Securities transaction tax, if you go for trading uh, securities, okay. 
and some examples current examples of indirect taxes are uh, goods and services tax we call it gst another gst there can be cgst sgst igst different taxes are there and customs duty earlier we have excise duty service tax okay entertainment tax road tax so many uh, taxes are there most of these are either fully or partially abolished after introduction of the goods and services tax in india okay now coming to the income tax laws in india so i will focus mainly on the income tax okay now income tax is one of the i mean very important part of the direct tax in india and income tax laws in india i mean income tax laws means we need to know some provisions that how to find out what is your income who is liable to pay uh, uh, the income uh, tax on the income when they are liable to pay the tax on income so this should be guided by some scriptures by some you know guidelines by some provisions where it is written so there are number of acts number of rules regulation etc which actually constitutes the total gamut of the income tax laws in india first and most important thing is the income tax act 1961 so this is the main pillar of the income tax laws in india income tax act 1961 and as it is an act you know as it happens to other act as well the section 1 so this is a very vast uh, act in india and it contains uh, you know uh, 298 sections and lot of subsections clauses sub clauses proviso explanation many things are there these 298 sections are you know ranging over 23 chapters and uh, it also contains 14 schedules okay it's a big act that way and in the section 1 of this income tax act 1961 which states about the what would be the title the scope of the act commencement of the act as per section 1 there is a first section of the income tax act 1961 states that it extends over whole of india so it extends over whole of india and it came into force on 1st april 1962 okay and the title of the act would be the income tax act 1961 this is the basic thing and in this act it is written that's uh, who uh, who have to pay tax how much uh, tax they have to pay by what time every detail okay how to calculate make the computation everything is there in the income tax act 1961 and we have to study various sections subsection of this another important thing is the annual finance act so every year we have a budget generally in the month of march or february okay and through this budget you know the changes or the amendments if it is required in the income tax act 1961 that is done so every year there is a finance bill which is presented by our ministry of finance okay uh, union ministry of finance in the in the parliament and uh, after it gets approval okay there be you know in this finance bill there may be some amendments or changes uh, which may be in connection with the direct taxes like income tax which can be in connection with the, uh, other indirect taxes whatever it may be so changes uh, will be proposed in the finance bill which will be presented in the parliament both houses of the parliament there is a lok sabha and rajya Raj sabha will approve it and thereafter finally when it gets the assent of the president of india it becomes finance act and the changes that is pro proposed over there if it gets the assent of the president of india the obviously subsequent change will be there in the income tax act 1961 so every year you know there may be some changes in the income tax and that changes uh, comes uh, through this finance act and another important thing in the finance act is that's all the rate of taxes at what rate uh, um, um, uh, you will apply on your total income that is also mentioned in the finance act so that way finance act is very important part of the income tax act 1961 and every year amendments are made to the income tax act through this finance act now another part is income tax rules because you know income tax rules is nothing but it is done by the cbdt Uh, to carry out the purposes of the act because sometimes you know some valuation suppose in the income tax act says that how to calculate this or there may be some process but detail guideline for calculation of this is not there so that can be stated in the income tax rules and that 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 uh, is generally uh, uh, i mean uh, these guidelines and everything is made by the cbdt that is central board of direct taxes here i want to tell you one thing that's under the ministry of finance there can be department of revenue and you know there is an income tax act 1961 but for the administration for the proper implementation for the collection and levy of this act okay so some board should be there to look after that whether there is what are the provisions are there in the income tax act it is properly you know uh, implemented or not so that's why we need uh, some body 
So this is called CBDT, Central Board of Direct Taxes, which works under the Department of Revenue under Ministry of Finance. And this CBDT makes rules for carrying out the purposes of the tax, that uh, purpose of the act, that is income tax rules. Okay, so many guidelines, many uh, uh, think, many rules uh, they propose in order to carry out the provision which is there in the Income Tax Act. And another thing is circulars and notifications. These are also generally, you know, uh, notified by the CBDT. Uh, the circular from time to time. Suppose uh, there is a thing called uh, filing your income tax return. So at the end of the year, you have to disclose how much income you earned during a particular previous year. And this disclosure of information should be done by a particular date. Clear? So normally, suppose it is the 31st July of the next year. Clear? But sometimes because of certain reasons, suppose the pandemic is there, flood is there, because of certain reason, government want to extend these days by another one month or three months. So we'll do it. So there must be a notification for that. So CBDT comes out with the notification uh, because of, uh, you know, uh, uh, to clarify certain aspects or to, you know, uh, announce something. So this is what is circular and notification, which is also very important. And the last court's decision. So on many aspects, you know, there are high court decisions, Supreme Court decisions uh, are there. So when we actually make calculation on this, we also have to take into consideration those important high court and Supreme Court decisions. Okay. So this is the total, you know, scope. I mean, uh, how income tax laws in India comprises of uh, acts, Finance Act, rules, notification, court decision, etc. Now coming to the Income Tax Act 1961, some definitions. So you, as I told you, the, this act uh, starts with the section one. I told you also section one just tells you that what is the name of the act, uh, 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 from when it, it will start, and uh, uh, it extends to the whole of India, that's the section one. Section two in any act, defines various terms that would be used in a particular act. So here also in Income Tax Act, Section 2 deals with different definition that will, some of the definition I will come to this, okay. But before that one very important section is Section 4. So all the sections I have written is the section under Income Tax Act 1961. So under Section 4 it is written that when one has to pay tax, at what rate, by what time and who will pay, everything is answered. This is called basis of charge section, charging section of income tax. So income tax is to be charged on the total income of the previous year of every person during the assessment year at the specified rate or rates. So who has to pay income tax? Every person. Okay, so we need to know who are the person. So definition uh, of person will come to know. So on what they, they, this person has to pay the uh, this tax on the total income total income that they earned during a particular year called previous year. Okay, so any person, every person that the total income they earned during a previous year on which they have to pay tax. At what rate? At the specified rate or rates which will be specified in the annual finance act. Clear? And in which year they have to pay? In the assessment year. So you learn the definition of this, what is total income, what is previous year, who are the person, who are the assessees, who are the assessment year in the due course. And this is the main part that, uh, I mean, when and how income tax will be collected, that is under section four of the Income Tax Act 1961. Now coming to the definition of person. So who are the person under Income Tax Act? Persons are this person, and this person definition is there in the section two, subsection 30. Sorry, clause 31. Uh, section 2, clause 31, it is defined that who are the person. Okay, it's a, I, I told you the section 2 deals with various definitions under Income Tax Act. So you can see persons actually consist of seven categories. Individuals, so individuals means natural person like you and me. Okay, that's the human beings. So individual, that can be male, female, other, minor, uh, person of unsound mind, lunatic, anybody. Okay, then Hindu undivided family, it's nothing but a family uh, which comprises uh, with uh, all the you know persons who are linearly descended from a common ancestors and uh, that includes their wives and the daughters so it is not nothing just like a joint family okay and uh, if any income accrues from the joint uh, property uh, or from the ancestral property joint family property or from the ancestral property then on that income i mean tax can be assessed as Hindu undivided family. So in income tax, it is not defined, but as per Hindu law, uh, I told you, uh, Hindu undivided family is that family which comprises with all the members, okay, uh, who are, you know, um, uh, I mean, um, linearly descended from, the, from a common ancestor and including their wives and the 
daughters. Okay, and uh, just an example of that, suppose uh, there is a person called Mr. X, uh, his wife, Mrs. Uh, X, okay, they may have three children, they are wives, they may have two daughters, okay, and uh, they may have grandchildren and granddaughters, so all of them, they can be termed as a Hindu undivided family, and there can be a joint family property from that, if there is an income, that would be assessed under uh, the category Hindu undivided family. And in this case, head of the family will be termed as Karta. Head of the family will be termed as Karta. So this is also important thing. And another very interesting thing is that in India, you know, there are other than Hindu undivided family, there are Sikh undivided family, there are Jain undivided family. So they will also be assessed under this particular category, Hindu undivided family. Now company, all of all the company, whether it is listed company, private company, government company or foreign company or Indian company, all the company has to be, uh, I mean, they have a different category company. Okay. Firm including LLP, firm means the partnership firms. So that would also be treated as a, uh, you know, part, all the partnership firms which is registered under uh, Partnership Act 1932 and all the limited liability partnership firm which is registered under, you know, Limited Liability Partnership uh, Act 2008, they will also, uh, you know, come under the fourth category uh, of the person. Now, another thing is that association of persons, AOP or body of individuals, BOI. So association of persons is a association of different persons, just like suppose persons. So uh, persons means, you know, uh, suppose one individual, another company, another firm. These three persons, three different type of persons making an associ association uh, to for the promotion of a common venture for the promotion of a common, you know, uh, enterprise, then it would be treated as an association of persons. So what is important is that there should be a common agenda, there should be a common action in this case. And this association should not be only of the individuals. They can be co a combination of individual, company, firm, local authority, whatever it may be. Okay. And one glaring example uh, under association of persons is cooperative societies. Clear. Body of individuals is just like an association, but it is an association of only individuals. Like generally we, our clubs. Okay. So normally you call Mohan Bagan clubs, in the East Bengal clubs, Mohan sporting clubs, or any sport clubs or other clubs. They will be assessed uh, in the category of body of individuals. So what is the basic difference between two is that association of persons may be an association of different persons, like individual, Hindu undivided family, company, farm, etc. But body of individuals only comprises of individuals. Okay. Now local authority means any body which has a control on the local funds, like municipality, municipal corporations, municipal committees, cantonment board, okay, panchayats, uh, they are local authorities. And finally, interesting part is artificial juridical person. So any person who is not an uh, artificial person, that is, they are not natural person like you and me, they are not human being. Any artificial person, okay, if they have a, a, a legal status, okay, legal entity in the eyes of law, but they are not falling under any of the preceding six categories, they will be assessed as artificial juridical persons. So they are not natural persons, they are not human beings, but they have some, you know, uh, uh, juristic uh, legal juristic entity or status okay in the eyes of law but they are not falling under any of the preceding six categories then they will be assessed as artificial juridical person like university west bengal state university calcutta university delhi university if they are not assessed uh, in any of the previous six categories they will be uh, assessed as artificial juridical person bar council uh, okay uh, then one interesting thing is that uh, gods deities okay uh, idols so they, they they also have to pay tax on their income they earn uh, uh, through offerings or like this okay so they are they will be termed as artificial juridical person so this is covered under section 2 subsection sorry uh, wrongly i'm saying section 2 clause 31 of the income tax act 1961 now uh, giving definition of uh, two important thing assessment year and the previous year okay so this is very important for calculation of total income in general you know here in income tax year always starts from the first april of a year and it ends on the 31st march of the next year okay we do not follow calendar year clear so what is assessment year assessment year means a period of 12 months okay commencing on first april every year 
So every year is assessment year that way. And it is always uh, comprises of 12 months and it is uh, stated this definition is uh, legal definition under section two, clause nine of the Income Tax Act 1961. And what is previous year? Previous year means financial year immediately preceding the assessment year. So financial year, which is immediately preceding that assessment year, and it is defined under section three. Now in small, simple terms, what is happening there? So there, there is an year that is normally starting from the 1st April of uh, some year, and it ends on 31st March of the next year, okay? So every year, in which you are earning your income, it is called previous year. And the year in which the income of this previous year will be assessed to tax. Tax will be determined on this income, this is called assessment year. Okay, so that way we can call every year is previous year and every year is assessment year. I gave one example here. Income earned during the previous year 2021-22 is taxable in the assessment year 2022-23. Okay. Now, just giving here one thing, suppose there is an year, 2021-22, okay. Now this can be previous year, this can be assessment year. One particular person who earned during this particular year, which starts from the 1st April of 2021 and ends on 31st March of 2022, we write this way, 2021-22. Suppose they earned 10 lakh rupees during this particular year, okay. So for this income, it is a previous year in which you are earning the income. The tax has to be paid on this state lakh in which year? In the immediately following year. So in this case, this is your previous year for the this 10 lakh rupees. You are earning this income in this year. And for this previous year, assessment year would be 2022-23. That is immediately following year. So this income, on, on this income, you have to pay tax in this year. So for this previous year, this is the assessment year. And for this assessment year, this is the previous year. Okay, now question is that suppose this person also earned some income during this year, suppose 15 lakh rupees. Okay, so for this 15 lakhs, this is a previous year and that income of 15 lakh will be taxed in the next immediately following year that is in 2023-24. So this year is a previous year for this income. Okay, and this year is the assessment year for this. So this is previous year for this assessment year, and this is also an assessment year for this previous year. So that way you can call every year is a previous year, and every year is an assessment year, okay. Now, sometime assessment year always would be of 12 months, not more than that, not less than that. But previous year can be less than 12 months, okay. When, only when, when, an in, when anybody starts a new, you know, uh, uh, business or profession in the middle of the year, or a new source of income, you know, uh, exist, uh, start existing from that particular year, or a old business, you know, uh, discontinued during the year, then only previous year can be less than 12, uh, months. So I've just uh, uh, cited one case here. An individual starts a business on and from 1st September 2021. Suppose that particular individual do not have any other income from any other source. Okay. So now for this particular individual, what would be the previous year? I mean, and what is the assessment year for this? So you started the business on and from 1st September 2021. So your previous year would be normally will be what? starting from 1st September 2021 to 31st March 2022. Okay, so it's a smaller than, I mean shorter than the 12 months because before 1st September you didn't have any income whatsoever. Okay, so here previous year will be a fraction, not the two, exactly 12 months. And this income that you are earning from September 2021 to March 2022 will be taxed in the assessment year immediately following year that is called 2022-23. Now, this individual also earning some income, suppose also earning income during the next uh, assessment year, I mean 2022-23, that would be taxed in the, uh, I mean, uh, next assessment year, that is 2023-24. So, only when you are starting your business or only when you are first time getting your job and first, uh, first time you are having some income, that year can be less than 12 months. Other, other years, you know, uh, next years onwards, it would be a complete 12 months previous year, a complete 12 months assessment year. Okay, so this is one uh, the point that you have to keep in mind. Now coming to the some exceptions. So normally what is the general rule? 
that is whatever income you are earning in the previous year on which you have to pay tax in the immediately following year. That is the assessment year. This is the normal rule. But sometimes what happens, the year in which you are earning the income, in that particular year, you have to pay the tax. So here, the cases where previous year and assessment year would be same. Okay. Now this type of provision, there are five exceptions to the general rule. Five exceptions to the general rule. So cases where income of a previous year is to be assessed in the previous year itself. Okay, so it would not be taxable. We cannot wait to tax your income that you earned in the previous year for the next assessment year. So there are six, five, uh, five exceptions. It's a very common question in the examination that write down the exceptions to the general rule of that. So shipping business of non-resident. So just uh, giving one example. Suppose if a ship income, one non-resident, non okay, earning income from the shipping business. Okay, and suppose, uh, just take an example, a ship um, uh, carrying passengers or carrying goods arrived in India in the month of uh, May 2022. And after that, you know, it uh, uh, done its business over there under income in India and left the soil of India uh, in the month of June 2022. Now, they are earning the income from May 2022 to June 2022. Okay, so the previous year is falling in between 2022 to 23 years. So it would be assessed in the next year, that is 2023, 24. But once the ship, you know, goes back to their country and it is run by a non-resident, so who knows uh, whether they will pay in the next year or not, how to track this? So government is saying before the ship leaves the country, you have to pay the tax in the same year in which you are earning. So this is one such case, shipping business of non-resident. Persons leaving India, if the assessing officer is of the view, it appears to the assessing officer that one particular person who is leaving India, okay, um, who can leave India during the year or uh, within a short period after expiry of the year, then what would happen? That person and that person do not have any intention to return back to India, then their income, whatever income they are earning in that year would be taxed in that year. Okay, association of persons, body of individuals, artificial juridical person formed for a particular event or purpose. Sometimes these persons may join together, get together to, you know, or, or, or uh, uh, an association for a particular event. Suppose there is an Olympic uh, event is happening or suppose, you know, Commonwealth Games is happening. So it, it would be for the next three months, we have to supply some particular raw materials or particular type of t-shirts to the government. So it's a venture that we have created only for the three months in the previous year. Thereafter, it, it would not be there. So whatever income you earn from that uh, temporary venture, okay, you have to pay tax in that particular previous year. Don't wait for the next assessment year. The person is likely to transfer property to avoid tax. So you are selling or disposing your uh, uh, property, okay, and uh, to avoid tax. That, that, that in that case also, you will be taxed immediately. And discontinued business. If you have a business, now it is discontinued during the year. So obviously, uh, next year onwards, who knows where you will be there to pay the tax. So in the year, you have to pay the tax on the discontinued business. So this is the five exceptions to the general rule. That is, uh, income generally of the previous year taxed in the assessment year, but in these five cases, income of the previous year would be taxed in the previous year itself. Okay, now coming to the next definition, important definition under Income Tax Act, SSC. Okay, now remember, who are the SSC? So it's written the first thing that SSC means any person who is liable to pay tax or any other sum sum under the Income Tax Act 1961. So who has some, you know, uh, liability to pay tax or interest or penalty, anything, any other sum under the Income Tax Act, he will be treated as SSE. But in addition to this, some other persons are, are, are also known as the SSE under the Income Tax Act 1961. The second type of person is any person uh, in respect of whom any proceedings has been taken for the assessment of his income or loss or refund or uh, income or loss of any other persons. Suppose that I need not to pay anything. No income tax is uh, to be paid by me, but some assessment proceedings, okay, some notice or some something, you know, uh, uh, has been started by the income tax authority against me in connection with my income, my loss, or in connection with determination of some refund due to me, okay, or in connection with some income or loss in, uh, of some other person, okay. So then I will be termed as SSE. Though I need not to pay anything, but still I will be termed as SSE, 
okay and uh, next thing is that okay and the next uh, is that uh, a person who is deemed to be an assassin under the act so deemed to be an assassin means you know you are not an assassin either you have no liability to pay any tax or against you no proceedings has been initiated by the income tax department but still you will be assumed to be an assassin okay you will be taken to be an assassin so deemed to be an assassin under this act sometimes you know there is a minor child so there may be a legal guardian so guardian will be treated as a deemed to be an assessee sometime there is a deceased person and income on the property of the deceased person so deceased person cannot be an assessee there, there can be legal representative of the deceased person sometime there can be a non resident who is not there in india okay so there can be a representative assessee who will be assessed on behalf of that non resident okay so these are called deemed to be an assessee they don't have any liability to the income tax they uh, i mean income tax has not uh, come out with any proceedings against them but still they will be assumed to be an assessee under the income tax act okay and the last uh, interesting thing a person who is deemed to be an assessee in default under the act so assessee includes deemed to be an assessee assessee also includes deemed to be an assessee in default suppose i don't have any liability to pay but as per law i have to you know do something some act i have to perform by a particular date if i miss it then i will be termed as deemed to be an assessee in default suppose you know personally i don't have to pay any tax to the government so i am not assessee that way but as per law i am supposed to deduct tax from other persons income clear if i fail to deduct the tax by a particular time then i will be termed as uh, deemed to be an assessee in default under the act so assessee means all these persons and that is defined under section 2 clause 7 of the income tax act now here i must say that all the assessees are persons but all persons are not the assessee okay so there may be a person an individual who does, doesn't have any income okay that can be so okay so all the assessees are persons but all persons are not the assessee now coming to the determination of total income under the income tax act 1961 so some basic idea we have regarding various uh, concepts like previous year assessment year persons assessees etc now coming the giving just uh, in brief way giving you the overall idea how actually total income is calculated under income tax act clear so there may be some steps and this way if you can remember these steps you can also understand that how your syllabus is organized okay so first thing whenever we have to calculate uh, income tax or you know total income of a particular person during a year the first thing that is to be determined is the residential status of that particular person and that is very important to know the scope of total income okay so these two i mean specifically i am focusing on the residential status though i will not go into the detail of this residential status determination just to give you an idea what is this and why it is so important that before you start calculating anything determination of residential status is must because you know depending on your residential status what type of income will be taxable in india you know it varies suppose you know um, normally for individual and for hindu undivided family there are three types of residential status one normally ordinarily resident okay not ordinarily resident another one is called non resident but for other type of persons like you know company farms aop boi artificial juridical person etc only two types of residential are there resident non resident as in our syllabus Uh, you know it's focus on the residential status of individual just just you know a bit briefly focusing on this so residential status of individual assessee now just think about it you are suppose now how to calculate this residential status that depends on uh, the duration how many days you are present in india okay so it depends on the calculation uh, that depends on how many days your your uh, duration of presence in india on that this residential status whether you are resident or non resident that depends now if you are resident in india and ordinarily resident in india then what happens global income will be taxed in india suppose you are in india you are doing job some jobs in india okay you are getting salary from uh, in india so obviously it will be taxable in india but suppose you have some property in the new york in the us as well 
and you are earning some income from that or you invested in a company shares which is listed which is an american company and you are getting some dividend so the source of that income is not india it's other country whether it would be taxable in india so that depends on your residential status if you are resident an ordinary resident in india your global income will be taxed in india whatever be the source it can be india it can be japan it can be usa it can be nigeria wherever from you earn the income it would be taxable in india if you are a ordinary resident in india but if you are a non resident in india generally it is not so okay so that's why it is very important before that is the important sometime question comes what is the importance of de determination of residential status of a particular person so this is the importance that depending on residential status which income will be taxable in india which type of income will be taxable in india that differs and scope of total income under section 5 of the income tax says that's for which income will be taxable for which type of uh, persons so if you are resident an ordinary resident so which income will be taxable in india that is written in section 5 if you are resident but not ordinary resident then which income will be taxable in india if you are a non resident then which income will be taxable in india so first under section 6 we have to determine what is your residential status and then which income will be taxable in india that is defined under section 5 of the income tax act 1961 so this is the first step now coming to the next part that is very important part we have already you know determined our residential status we know that what are the incomes that will be taxable in india now how to compute this how to compute your total income in india so in india in income i mean you can earn any person can earn income from different sources it can be salary it can be house property rental income it can be on sale or purchase of shares it can be dividend it can be interest income it can be income from horse race it can be many 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 hundreds and thousands of sources are there okay but whatever be the source whatever be the source of your income whatever be the type of income everything would be categorized under five heads that is mentioned under section 14 of the income tax act okay so income under different heads in 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 income tax under income tax there are only five heads under which all the income that you are earning will be categorized okay so first head is salaries so first head is you are earning income under the head what salaries okay and that is governed i mean how to calculate the salary income that is governed by section uh, you know all the provisions regarding how to calculate salary income salary includes you know uh, salary bonus wages commissions okay perquisites uh, allowances like dearness allowance medical allowance many things are there and which will be taxable which will not be taxable everything is stated where under section 15 to section 17 clear so this is salaries now one thing i must say that when and income will be treated as salaries remember if there is an employee employer relationship only when the income that you are getting okay will be taxable under the head salaries okay so there must be employee employer relationship your employment must be maybe full time maybe part time okay you may earn salaries from more than one employer at a time but there must be employee employer relationship okay so one such example i can give you suppose you are uh, and you you did an mba okay and thereafter you are employing in a particular company and advising and uh, giving some consultancy regarding some management operations or whatever it may be okay so you are the employed in the organization getting a regular salary so whatever you are earning from that particular company your employer it would be taxable under the head salaries but suppose you are not employed in the company you have a different you know separate consultancy firm and you are doing freelancing or you are you know uh, uh, selling your uh, professional knowledge so you are not the employee of that organization in that case your income or the fees or whatever you are earning that would not be taxable under the head salaries but under which head it would be taxable i will come to this later likewise i can tell you that you know uh, in a company a director okay if a director is a employee of that organization whatever fee they get that would be treated under the head salaries but if the director is not the employee of the organization that would not be treated under the salaries head sometimes you know mlas mps they also get some remuneration okay so whether their remuneration will be taxable under the head salaries no because they are not the government employees they are not the government employees so their mla mps remuneration will not be taxable under the head i mean this is called salaries okay 
So detail you will learn and this is a very important chapter. Next head is income from house property and how to determine income from house property that you know uh, being covered under section 22 to 27 you can see that every I mean these are very chronologically and interestingly um, arranged 15 to 17 salaries and thereafter few sections are now abolished. And so 22 to 27, you know, how to determine income from house property, that is. Now, under income from house property, which income will come? Mainly rental income from letting out of or from uh, uh, the house property. Okay, rental income. Now, in this case, I just tell you one very interesting thing. In, under Income Tax Act, it is not only how much rental income you are getting from the house property, it is also important what is the inherent capacity what is the potentiality of the house to earn the income okay suppose you have uh, one particular uh, house property house property may be you know building flat whatever it may be including the land in which it was built in okay so suppose you have a flat and that you gave on a rental basis okay now suppose you have one particular flat and you are earning rent from that particular flat okay so this rental income will be taxable under income for house property but in income tax under income tax it is not only how much rental income you are earning it is also important how much you could have earned by uh, re uh, letting out this property okay suppose it, it, it may so happen that you are earning only 10,000 per month but in the nearby area Okay, you could have you could have earned twenty thousand per month. So in income tax, you know, annual value of that property will be calculated on the basis of not only how much you are rent you are realizing, but also how much rate you could have get. Okay, so the fair, fair valuation would be done, and on the basis of that, an annual value of that property will be calculated, and that annual value will be taxable under income from house property. Another thing is that, suppose you may have two, three house properties, two, three building through two, three properties you may have. One of them, which is used for your uh, self-occupied purpose and residential purpose. It is used for your, uh, uh, for your own uh, residential purpose. That particular house property's annual value would be nil. No tax we have to, so one, only one. But suppose you have two house properties and both of these used for your self-occupancy purpose and that is used for residential purpose, okay, in both these houses. Then what would happen? Only out of this, only one house property at per your choice would be, you know, annual value of that property will be taken to be nil and other property would be treated as a deemed to be let out. That means though from the other property, other property is also used for your residential purpose. You are not earning any income. Okay, but how much rental income the other property could have earned that would be taxable in income tax. So in income tax only one house property which is used for residential purpose that would be you know annual value would be nil. All other property whether you are letting out this property or using for your personal purpose they will all be taxable under income from house property. Only thing is that if you use your house property for your business purpose, then income from this house property will not be taxable under this head. Uh, uh, under, uh, it will be taxable under some other head. Now fourth head is, uh, you know, uh, uh, profits and gains or from business or profession. It's a common head. That means uh, your business income will be taxable under this head and that is, you know, they will be determined under section 28 to 44. And under this particular head, professional income will also be taxed. So income by a lawyer, income by a doctor, income by a chartered accountant, by an art engineers, architects, okay. They are uh, uh, professing their knowledge and selling their knowledge and earning income. So that professional income will be taxable under profits and gains from business profession. I told you that if you use your house property for business purpose, it will be taxable under income from house property that will be taxable under profits and gains from business or profession okay now fourth head is a capital gains and uh, the, that is to be calculated by following the provisions uh, from section 45 to section 55 of the income tax act so what is capital gains capital gains means whenever you are earning any profit on the transfer that is on the sale or transfer of any capital asset so here we need to know what is capital asset. I will not focus in the detail of this capital asset. Simply think that if you are the owner of a capital asset, okay, and you are selling the capital asset at a profit, that profit will be taxable under the head capital gains. So by definition, you know, house property is a capital asset, shares, uh, securities, these are also capital assets. 
So uh, we have to go into the detail of what is capital asset. And there can be two types of capital gains, short term capital gains and long term capital gains. Clear? So now I, I, uh, telling, uh, I'm telling you one example. Suppose you have let out one house property and regular basis you are getting a rent. That rental income will be taxable under income from house property. But if you sell that house property at a profit, okay, profit means sale price minus your cost price. So if you sell that house property at a profit, that profit will be taxable under the head capital gains. Clear? Because that house property is a capital asset and you are selling and earning profit. So that would be taxed under the head capital gains. So if you invested in a, uh, shares and you earned a profit, so that would be taxable under capital gains if you're an investor, okay? And the last head that is called, sometimes call it residuary head. Residuary means any income which is not taxable under any of the preceding four heads, it would be taxable under the residuary head that is called income from other sources. And the provision for determination of how much income from other sources you have, that is determined under section 56 uh, to 59 of the Income Tax Act. So like dividend from company shares. Okay, so if you are investing in the shares, dividend from the share will be taxable under income from other sources. But if you earn profit by selling those shares, that would be taxable under capital gains. So income from other source, dividend income, okay. Uh, then uh, interest from fixed deposits and other income. So everything will come under income from other sources. It also includes some casual income, like, you know, winning from raw uh, horse races or, or crossword uh, puzzles or betting, gambling, some TV shows like Kaun Baranga Karorpati. So if you earn some, some, some income out of it, these will be taxable under income from other sources. Now, I just going back, uh, I mean, just I, I, I say it at the time of discussion of the salaries, that is MPs and MLAs, if they get the remuneration, they are not the government employee, so their income will not be taxable under the head salaries. So that would be taxable under income from other sources. If you are a, uh, if you have a, a management consultancy firm and offering this consultancy to different companies, you are not the employee of any organization getting a remuneration. Okay, that can be either taxed under profits and gains from business profession. This is your profession, or it can be taxed under income from other sources. Okay. So these are the five important heads, okay? And all types of sources of income, okay? Source means one particular type of income. And head means, I mean, only these five heads. So suppose you may have a textile business. You may have a printing business. So these are the different sources. You are earning income from textile business. This is one source. You are earning income from the uh, printing business. This is another source. And all these sources will be taxable under the head profits and gains from business or uh, profession. So there can be different sources, but all the sources of income, all the types of income, ultimately will be taxed under any of these five heads of income. Now when we calculate, and we have to sum up this, this five uh, income under these five heads, we have to sum up. But at the time of summing up, one, we have to keep in mind that as per income tax, you know, there are certain sections called section 10, 11, 12, 13, 13A, 13B, etc. So some incomes under income tax are exempted. Exempted means tax-free income. We need not to pay any tax. Some of the incomes are partially exempted. Some of the incomes are fully exempted. Okay. So when we are calculating these incomes, we have to keep in mind that those exempted income should not be part of this. So they would be like one example of that is agricultural income. Generally, agricultural income is exempted indeed, but not all, I mean, not fully exempted. Some of the incomes are partially exempted. Some of the income is, uh, uh, you know, uh, fully exempted. So normally, agriculture income, that is your business. So income from that uh, operation would be taxable under profits and gains from business profession. But if it is fully exempted, then nothing will come under this head. Or if it is partly exempted, suppose if you have a business from the operation of growing and manufacturing tea, Okay, only 60% will be treated as agricultural income, 40% will be treated as business income. So 40% of that particular uh, business income will be taxable under profits and gains from business or profession. So always keep in mind when we are calculating all these, we have to exclude exempted income that is governed under section 10 to section 13B of the Income Tax Act. Now, this is the first thing and very important thing, I mean, for after that, what we have to do, we have to club, we have to add up 
the income under all these five heads and thereafter we have to you know make some adjustment to get what to get gross total income so first thing is that we have to find out the income under five heads and thereafter we have to add clubbing of income that is sometime income of some other person would be taxable in 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 in, in the hands of the assessee okay so income of the minor child income of the spouse in some cases subject to certain conditions will be clubbed in the uh, hands of uh, the assessee so after adding up the income under the five heads we also have to uh, uh, club the income uh, under section 60 to 65 and thereafter we also make, have to make some adjustment for set off and carry forward of losses and that is governed by section 70 to 79 simple example i can give you one thing uh, i can give you uh, there is suppose you have a two businesses okay one is a textile business another one is a printing business suppose during the year you are earning uh, income of 5 lakhs from the textile business from the pin printing business you are incurring a loss of 1 lakh so how much would be your income under the heads uh, profits and gains from business or profession that is 4 lakh from the textile business 5 lakhs from the textile business it's a profit minus the loss okay so that loss that you are incurring from the printing business will be set off from the profit of the textile business so that way set off can be done okay if that loss fully cannot be set off. Suppose this year, profit from the textile business is 5 lakh, but loss from the printing business is 6 lakhs. Okay, so this year, what would happen? From profit of 5 lakh, it will deduct 5 lakh. But another 1 lakh loss, what you will do? It will be carried forward to the next year. Okay, next year, whatever you will have a profit from that, you can. So this provision, set off and carry forward of losses, very important provisions. So that also we have to make. So adjustment of this will be, uh, you know, uh, in, in between different sources, different heads. Suppose uh, a loss from house property can be set up from uh, in, you know, profit of uh, profits uh, and gains from business profession. These type of things are there. We'll learn it in detail. Finally, we'll get what? Gross total income. Sometimes short notes come. What is gross total income? So what would be the definition of gross total income? So GTI, gross total income is nothing but the summation of the income under the five heads plus we have to make the adjustment for the clubbing of income and set up and carry forward of losses. And then whatever the figure we'll get, that is called gross total income. From this gross total income, there will be some deductions. So from the gross total income, some deductions will be allowed to you. And that is governed under chapter 6A. Uh, Sorry, here there is a printing mistake. It should be chapter 6A, capital letter A. Okay, that is from section 80C to 80U. A lot of sections are there, a lot of sections are there. So uh, some deductions you will get from GTI. After those deductions, okay, the final amount that you will get, that is the computation of the total income. So finally, we arrived at the total income on which we have to pay the tax. So last step is to find out the tax liability. Finding out the tax liability is for individual assessing. There are different slabs, different tax rates are there. You have to apply those tax rates, okay, on the total income. So total income calculation, first determine the residential status and then uh, find out the uh, income under the five heads, excluding the exempted incomes. Okay, consider your clubbing of income and then adjust for the setting of and carry forward of losses. And finally, you get the GTI. From the GTI, you may be eligible. Many reduction under section 80C, 80G, 80U, many, many, many sections are there. Okay, some of the sections we have to study in our uh, syllabus. So after deducting those, okay, finally we will arrive. Uh, at the computation of total income. Always keep in mind, because of the deductions, your total income cannot be negative. Suppose your gross total income is 10 lakhs. Your total amount of deduction, you are eligible 11 lakhs. So total income cannot be negative, total income will be nil, either positive or nil. So total income you calculate and find out your tax liability applying uh, uh, specified rates that is applicable for the individual assesses and which are stated in the Annual Finance Act. So last slide, so just uh, uh, here I showed you that how actually it is calculated. So salaries, income from house properties, profits and gains from business profession, capital gains, income from other sources. Add all the income under these five years, you get the gross total income. But remember at the time of calculation of the gross total income, exclude all exempted income, okay? And adjust for the clubbing income, clubbing of income, and set off and carry forward of losses, you get the GTI. From that you get the, you have the deductions if you have any and get the total income on which you have to pay the tax. Okay. So with this, I end my lecture over here. I think you will uh, enjoy this lecture. Happy learning.